All right, everybody, happy spring break Friday. Day we're not supposed to be in school, and a day that most of you are probably not even here. Uh, what we're going to talk about in this brief little story today are the revolutions in Latin America. We started a few um, while back talking about Toussaint Le Overture and his accomplishments on the island of Haiti. Now we're going to go back a little farther um, and look at what goes on in the continent of South America, where the Spanish have been since Pizarro conquered the Incas. And Argentina is going to be the first country to fight for its independence from Spain. In 1806, the Argentinian colonists fought off the British in the city of Buenos Aires. And since they were able to defeat the British, the Spanish colonists begin to think, wait a minute, we've been paying the Spanish crown for protection. We're paying them to keep the soldiers here to help keep us safe from other people. But it wasn't the Spanish army that defeated the British. We did that ourselves. So what in God's name are we paying the Spanish crown for? So we simply don't need Spain to be our military. We can do it ourselves. Believing they could defend and attack aggressively for themselves, Argentina declares themselves independent from Spain in the year 1810. And the central figure in, in this is going to be a guy named Jose de San Martin. With Argentinian independence secured, Martin will lead Argentinian military forces into the two smaller countries of Paraguay and Uruguay to also liberate them from Spain. And while San Martin will lose some battles, he will eventually win the wars. Spain knew they had clearly lost control of these colonies. Everybody is now beginning to um, rebel. And so San Martin says, okay, we've got Argentina, we've got Paraguay, and we've got Uruguay. It's time to drive Spain out of the country they landed in in South America the, the long time ago where they've extracted wealth from the Potessi silver mine, they were going to attack and liberate Peru. Peru was seen as the greatest fortress of power of the Spanish on the South American continent. In 1817, Jose de San Martin led his army up over the Andes Mountain, an arduous, treacherous journey on the high oxygen deprived, very arid and dry and cold Andes Mountains. And when he gets there, he will spend some time in the city of Santiago in Chile. For three years, Martin will stay in Chile building a navy to transport his army up the coast to Peru. And when San Martin arrives in Peru, he drove out the Spanish. It wasn't easy. There was some bitter fighting, but he wins. Spain had controlled Peru since 1532 when Pizarro conquered the Incas. And now Spain had lost Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Chile, and Peru. They had lost almost two-thirds of their colonies in South America. South America is now almost free from Spanish control. And while Bolivar is up dominating, and, or is down dominating the southern part of South America, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Chile, and Peru. While he is moving south to north, the other South American liberator, Simón Bolivar, is coming north to south. And Bolivar is going to move towards Venezuela. Um, 
Bolivar in 1810 tries to help organize the liberation of Venezuela. And he tries to implement an UNTA, or a military takeover, in the Venezuelan capital of Caracas. But it was completely and totally unsuccessful. So Bolivar is banished. He is exiled. A couple years later, he comes back in 1814, and he loses again. And when he loses in 1814, a civil war breaks out as royalists challenge, challenge this new democratic republican government Bolivar wants to set up. And he's exiled again. Finally, he leaves, Bolivar leaves the Caribbean islands and he's back in 1816 and he launches his third rebellion or invasion against the Spanish government. And five years later, by 1821, he is finally successful. His forces capture the capital of Caracas and Bolivar is named the president of Venezuela as he drives out the Spanish. So here are the two men meeting. Here is Jode de San Martin and Simon Bolivar. In 1822, the South American liberators are going to join forces and they are going to liberate the country of Ecuador. After the liberation of Ecuador, they met in the city of Quito to discuss <clears throat> the future of Latin America. Unbelievably, Jose de San Martin wants to set up new monarchies. And Bolivar says, what are you talking about? Why would we set up monarchies? We've been fighting against them. We want democracy over here independent democratic republics. And so legend has it the two men will meet in a house, in a little hut in the mountains of the Andes. And they were in the hut for three days and there were three casks of wine that were taken and put into this little building. Three days later, both men emerge and all three casks of wine are gone. When they come out, they announce that Jose de San Martin is going to leave South America and that South America um, will um, follow the Bolivar path of independent democratic republics. So Bolivar will be named the George Washington of South America. Now we don't know what really went on in that meeting, but we do know that Jose de San Martin who led the South American forces against uh, the government, against the Spanish government, actually goes to live in Spain. Like, why would you go live in the area that you just fought? Nobody really knows, but that's where um, Jose de San Martin winds up. Legend has it that they were both um, members of the Masonic Order, and because Bolivar was higher level in rank as a Mason, that is what determined his victory and Jose de San Martin leaving. Don't know if that's true or not, but that's just part of the speculation. By 1824, Simon Bolivar had completely driven out the last of the Spanish forces, completely liberating South America and ending the longest lasting European empire in South America. It is all done. As a result of his success, <coughs> excuse me, in instituting democratic principles and democratic republics, again, Simone Bolivar is known as the George Washington of South America. So once again, we have a European mercantilistic absolutist monarchy that is defeated from movements among the colonists who are leading the masses. Popular rebellions against a European mother country who does not care about their interests. 
remember the difference between peninsulare and creole. And the same thing is going to happen in Mexico. Oops, I forgot this. All right, there we go. Uh, so there again is what I just said. The two men continue to work together. Bolivar wants democratic republics. He wins, and South America is liberated. But in Mexico, there was a Creole priest, half Spanish, half native Mexican priest, named Father Miguel Hidalgo. And Father Hidalgo had called for Mexican natives in his parish to rebel against their poor treatment by the Spanish government. He wanted them to simply ask for land reforms, to give them land that they could farm. And he is going to peacefully lead the members of his parish, his small community. Hang on a second. All the way towards Mexico City to go protest the government. Well, as he marches onward, he picks up more and more followers, more and more poor people join him. So on the way to Mexico City, Father Hidalgo is leading nearly 80,000 people, journeying to fight for their independence. Now on the journey, the Spanish government sent out their military forces to capture and get rid of not only Father Hidalgo, but these protesters. So they captured Father Hidalgo, and they dragged him to an intersection on a road they knew, and again, these are peaceful people at this point in time, they knew the protesters would have to cross, and they killed Father, Mid Father Miguel Hidalgo, chopped his body up, and spread it all over the intersection. When the people saw that, they didn't see it as a deterrent. They get angry. And they go and they capture some of the Spanish soldiers who did it, and they kill and dismember them. If you're going to do it to us, then we are going to do it right back to you. Well, the royalist soldiers will respond by committing horrible acts of violence. The protesters, the rebels, would then commit atrocities against the soldiers, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. And Father Hidalgo will be succeeded by uh, a um, mestizo priest, a native Mexican priest, known as Father Jose Pavon, P-A-V-O-N. And he was a little more radical than Father Miguel, who was his mentor, and he gets angry after his mentor was killed, and he calls not only for land reform, but the complete and total end to slave labor in the New World totally. In 1815, Father Pavon was also captured and executed, and with his death, the peasant um, uprising is gone. But clearly, people in Mexico, the Spanish in Mexico, saw the tide turning. So the Spanish will be driven from Mexico by Augustin de Iturbide. In 1820, there was an internal revolution going on in Spain, in the mother country. And King Ferdinand VII was forced to accept a new Spanish constitution. When that was happening, peninsulares, rich guys like Augustin Iturbide, were afraid of losing their title and their position. If they forced the king to do stuff in, in Spain that we don't like, it could cost us here in the New World. Now, Augustin Iturbide was a royalist. And he decides that he is going to take charge. And he declares Mexico to be independent of Spain. Mexico is a modern country. We now no longer have anything to do with the Spanish government over in the old country. And here is some of the shots there. There is um, Intervide. And... Uh, 
Well, Mexico will no longer be governed by Spain. It was governed by rich elitists who did not want social reform. It was governed by people who wanted to remain large, rich, wealthy plantation owners. And this was awesome. This not only delighted the British trade ships, but also the growing power of the United States. And in 1823, United States President James Monroe writes the Monroe Doctrine, which prohibits further European colonization of the Americas. He said, the western side of the Atlantic is the American zone. Do not mess with our side of the Atlantic. This is the United States sphere of influence, so you guys stay out. And while Interbahai gains independence from Mexico, just like in Haiti, the poor people of Mexico did not benefit. Right? They were still ruled by the rich, wealthy Spanish elitists who wanted to keep their job. Also benefiting from this is the United States, who has a much larger and greater presence in the region as a result. When we get back from spring break, we will talk about um, Brazil, and we will talk about Clemens von Metternich and the Congress of Vienna. Have a good break, people. We'll see you next Monday.